Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence once again by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So grateful and thankful for the access that you've given us just to approach the throne of grace boldly, knowing that we are your children, knowing that we stand in the perfect and finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we're not under law, but that we're under grace. We're so keenly aware of just how little we know. I just ask that the Holy Spirit be our teacher, that he guide us into all truth and filter out that which is foolishness and ignorance, but just seal to our hearts only that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the epistle to the Colossians, verse by verse, and we are in chapter 3, somewhere around the, the verse uh, verse 6. Uh, a lot of this uh, that you might hear in this video is a little bit of a, a continuation of what we were looking at in the previous video. I want to point out, first of all, that here that in uh, in first. Corinthians chapter 2, the Holy Spirit declares through Paul that I determined to know nothing among you except uh, Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Uh, Jesus Christ and Him crucified. His person, His work. And that is the content, basically, of our proclamation. That's the purpose for this ministry. That is the message that we preach the person and the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is what we are to preach. Um, we don't preach uh, on things, we preach on a person. The second chapter of our study here in Colossians, it ended with the fact that law will not work. If you've died with Christ, and we have, it's a first class condition in the Greek, uh, many of you are be becoming familiar with the first class condition. Since you died with Christ from the elements of the world, or if, or if you'd prefer in the Greek, if you've died and you have from the elements of the world system. And I pointed back to Galatians and, and I showed you in the fourth chapter that the world system is an ecclesiastical system so don't be amazed that the world hates you. You know, it, it hated Christ. It'll put you out of the synagogue thinking it does God's service. It'll put you to death thinking it's doing sacrifice to God. The world system is an ecclesiastical system. It isn't the common, um, the slang term that's used by most Christians. The world is everybody that, you know, doesn't live like you live. The world is the ecclesiastical system or the religious system. In the book of Revelation, the apostle John was amazed, he was absolutely amazed that the world system was dripping with the blood of the martyrs. Why was he amazed? Because it was the current system, the ecclesiastical system, the religious system that was martyring the members of God's family. That's the world system. If you died with Christ from the elements of the world system, why as though deriving or living from that system are you subject uh, to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not. These are men's ordinances. Don't you know that, that they perish when you die? They're of no value whatsoever in glory. They're of no value now which have no value in satisfying the flesh. The flesh profits nothing. We don't live by rules and regulations. We live by grace. We live by faith. So if law won't work, what will? And Galatians tells us, if, if you have not died to the law, you cannot live unto God. If you have not died to the law, you cannot, cannot live unto God. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? 
and it's it's been it's been it's been interesting to me how that over the past 33 some odd years I've yet to hear an honest sermon preached on those verses if you haven't died to the law you can't live unto God and we, and we began uh, in chapter 3 if then you be risen with Christ another first class condition since we've been risen with Christ seek those things which are above where Christ sits at the right hand of God. And I pointed out that our, our Lord himself said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these other things will be added unto you. And, well, so now I guess I spend the rest of this video, or I spend a half hour, 45 minutes or more, telling you how you, you, you uh, should diligently strive to be just as righteous as God is when it says his righteousness his righteousness is Christ seek ye first the kingdom of God and the person and work of Christ and all these other things will be added unto you I mean surely God's not telling you to seek to be as righteous as he his righteousness is not any effort on your part but it, it is the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ as it's been applied to your life He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. We stand before Him holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. We've been made righteous. Your new man is fully righteous, just as righteous as Jesus Christ. And now we have the urging of the Holy Spirit that our attention should be settled on things above. What are the things above? Is that everything that I want? You know, the things above can't be some empty space where I fill in the blanks. You know, the lusts of the flesh. We are, we're a long ways from God's righteousness through any effort of our own. We're, we're, we are an infinite way, uh, you know, away from being able to accomplish such a, a feat on our own but we are made righteous in the person and the work of Christ. The things above are those encompassing where Christ now sits, the person and the work of Christ. The text is telling us, folks, here that where Christ sits at the right hand of God, he's sitting, he's not working, means his work is finished. Christ declared on the cross, it is finished. He was referring to his work being finished and that work's been applied to our lives he's at the right hand of God we should understand what these idi idioms here are are saying uh, we talking a, a little bit about idioms here in this in this video the Bible is full of idioms in fact every language has its idioms the putting off and the putting on is an idiom. Now that that idiom, uh, in, any idiom can can either be figurative or literal. In in this, you know, a good example would be, well, it's raining cats and dogs. That's an idiom. We know it's really not raining cats and dogs. The putting off and the putting on, the putting off the old man and putting on the new man, is an idiom. Now, in fact, we have put off in the old man and put off the new man, and we're told to, to, to put off the old man and put on the new man. We're, what we're being told is to, is to be involved in something which is actually true of us, that we have put off the old man and we put on the new man. The incarnation. The, the Lord Jesus Christ is functioning as deity the incarnation is functioning as the deity and he's resting. He's sitting because his work is finished. And when he rises again, it'll be in judgment. When God speaks again, I hear people say all the time, well, God spoke to me. God doesn't speak to you apart from his word. The next time he does speak, it's going to shake the heavens and the earth. I am persuaded that most Christians do not comprehend the simple truth that Christ's work is finished for us.
The text says, ye are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. And, and, and we've come to our present study, the putting off of the old and the putting on of the new. And just about every sermon that I've heard preached on this has planted the dead seed in Christians' heads that putting off the old man is cleaning up the old man. So we look at all this stuff and we, we've got to, We've got to get to work. That's not what the Holy Spirit is showing us here. And that, and that putting on the new man is basically equivalent to cleaning up the old man. You know, folks, if we were able to clean up the flesh, dress up this old rotten corpse, the flesh, which profits nothing, if we were able to clean up the old man, which we're not, then what need would there be to put on anything? That, that, even that doesn't make sense. The very thought doesn't even make sense. All God would have had to say was just, just clean up the old man. You know, forget trying to put on some new man. So the truth concerning the two natures doesn't even enter the believer's head. It's primarily, the believer today is primarily in ignorance over the fact that, that he possesses two natures and that there's a conflict he stands in, in the middle of a conflict between these two natures because law teaches that you're only some single-natured individual in which you clean up the old man. And that is, folks, that is one of Satan's glosses. Satan wants you to seek to be as righteous as God in the old man and not realize that you are righteous in Christ in the new man. Dearly beloved, the text is telling you and I to live as though as those who have put off the old man and put on the new man that it's the new man wherein the father and the son and the holy spirit the very fullness of the triune god resides not the old man that's why that you were made a new creation in christ you couldn't have remained a single natured individual you had to be to, to be made a new creation in christ given a new nature, a sinless new nature, in which Christ could reside, because He can't be tainted, He can't be touched by sin. And that's the nature in which we function out of. That's, that's why we were made a new creation in Christ. That's why all old things have passed away and all things have become new. The Word of God teaches that you have put off the old man and you have put on the new to realize that, that you are, by virtue of the finished work of Christ, sinless in the new man. I'm, folks, I'm not preaching sinless perfection, but I am preaching the new man that is sinless and an old man that sins all the time and you in conflict between them. Therefore, we are not to lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and that you have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created it. Folks, let's go all the way back to Genesis. How did it start? Everything started with, let us make man in our own image. Now hold that thought, because by the end of the video, I'm going to take you all the way to the end of Scripture, all the way to the end of the Bible, and we're, we're going to look at something that I believe is parallels this whole reality of us being in the middle here and putting off the old man and putting on the new man. This is in perfect agreement with what we study in Ephesians. If many of you who have followed us through Ephesians, you might remember, this is a, not a command for you to do something, but a simple statement of something that's been done because of the finished work of Christ. And so you ought to live by its results. Now, in the, uh, in the fifth verse, mortify. Mortify means to put to death your members which are upon the earth. And millions of Christians, I don't think I'm exaggerating, are trying to do that themselves by means of the law. We are not under law, we're under grace. What the text says is count it as done. And folks, I wish I had the ability to make that as clear as I'd like for it to be. 
there has to be in Paul's epistles some place where God issues a first command. Okay? You know, man, I can only imagine what that is. Are you interested in what that is? There's, there's some place where God issues the first, the very first command, and you'd think that you'd be interested in that. You'd think that Christians would be interested in that. You know, what is that? What could that possibly be? Mow the lawn, clean out the barn, clean up your life, get your act together, Steve. Don't steal, don't cuss, don't commit adultery, don't fornicate, don't ever miss a church service. I can just, I can only imagine what this command's gonna be, and I come to Romans 6, 11, and bam, Reckon yourself dead indeed unto sin. And surprisingly, well, you know, I don't understand that. I don't know how to do that. Or maybe I've tried that. You say, you say I've tried that. It didn't work. Surely that can't be the first command given me by God. Yes, it is. It is. And so, you, you know, you rush past the verse, never giving it any real thought, and you continue on your way trying to make righteous what God said that you should reckon yourself dead to the old man. And if that isn't bad enough, you ignore the second half of the verse, but alive unto God in Christ, the new man. Romans 6, 11. Of putting off the old man and putting on the new man, the very same thought that we are studying right here in chapter 3 of Colossians. And since that's the first imperative used by my loving Heavenly Father, it, it's got to be, it must be a, a supremely important. The very first thing, the first thing God wants you to, to count as true, and most Christians, you know, well, they just wish that was true. Folks, don't tell me you keep trying to count yourself dead indeed unto sin and it ain't working. Don't tell me that. There's no work in the verse. The word is reckoned, count as true. The logic behind the word is looking at the evidence and count it as, as a fact. You're dead to sin. Don't tell me you'd like to be. That, you know, one of the longings of your life is to finally reach a, some, you know, a plateau, you know, where you'd be pretty close to dead to sin. Listen, dearly beloved, you are dead to sin and you are alive unto God. Reckon yourself as that, Romans 6, 11. And that ties in directly with what we're studying here in the third chapter of Colossians in putting off the old man and putting on the new. The, uh, the fifth verse of uh, Colossians 3, put to death, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. That is not a present tense. It's, it's the same idea that the Holy Spirit is using in Romans chapter 6. Count this as true, that your members which are upon the earth are dead to sin. It is, it's an aorist. It's never ceased to amaze me over the years how even pastor friends of mine say, you know, well, look, Steve, if I preach that to, to my congregation, well, they would go out and they'd just live terrible lives. And I always look at them and I say, your congregation's already living terrible lives. Putting you under law may on the outside, folks, whitewash some filth, but it won't redeem you. It will not regenerate you. And it certainly will not grow you. I've got friends who, who absolutely agree with me that we're not under law as it pertains to regeneration, redemption, new birth, but we're now all of a sudden we're back under law as a, as a means of, of spiritual growth in our walk. That is absolutely not true. In fact, it's actually grace from start to finish. The author and the finisher of our faith. I have the authority of this book, the Word of God, to declare unto you that it will have no value as far as the flesh is concerned. Lie not one to another. And I've, I pointed out, I believe, I hope I did in my last video, I've taken a vertical application of this passage primarily. But in, I in no way am, am saying that there's no horizontal line. I believe the Holy Spirit is saying 
that if we're right vertically, we'll be right horizontally. But I also believe that if you are right horizontally, it doesn't necessarily mean you're right vertically. You might be outwardly performing all of those things and not even be a Christian. You know, a wolf parading in sheep's clothing. And so I have stressed primarily the vertical application, lie not one to another, since you've put off the old man and put on the new. Folks, I think it's wrong to, for you to tell me that you make a million dollars a year when you only make 5000 But to tell me that, that I'm under law, not grace, or, or to even suggest that I, it's a combination of law and grace, is a terrible, 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 terrible lie. This is why I'm looking at this as spiritual. I believe the context bears that out. This book tells me that you're dead to sin and sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? Because you are not under law but grace. And how many of you folks out there are willing to say that when you sin, it's not I but that sins, but sin which dwells in me? And God knows I'm not trying to give you an excuse for sin. You don't need an excuse. Okay, you do a super job without, without an excuse. But I'm concerned about your comfort, your rest, your peace, and your joy before the Lord. Folks, when God strikes you down in an accident or with sickness, you know, are you going to sit there and, and mope? You know, I wonder what I did that I deserve. What did I do to deserve all this? Or are you going to be a Job? Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Do you really believe that God loves you with an everlasting love? That He holds you in the hollow of His hand? That He's never touched your life except in love? That He works all things together for your good? That He knows the way you take and when He's tested you, you shall come forth as gold? That He bottles your tears? I have had people write me and say, Lord must have a lot of my bottles. That He lights your candle. Let's guide your path. That He has your name branded on the palms of His hands. That He's promised that He'd never leave you nor forsake you. That you've suffered. That after you've suffered a little while, He'll absolutely strengthen, settle, comfort you. Do you know those truths, or? Or are you constantly being bombarded with the fact that you haven't done enough, prayed enough, saved enough, souls, witnessed enough, given enough, so that you're not living up to the standard that God has set before you, much of that garbage heaped upon you on your shoulders that was heaped upon your shoulders by those within that world religious system? You know, you you just you got a rotten Christian life unless and it, unless you get whipped into shape, you whip yourself into shape. You'll never be of any value in the family, in the household of God. We saw in the second chapter that God is involved in a great conflict for you in order that why, that your heart might be comforted. And very few Christians have comfort. Let's, let's look at a few of these other awful terms here, you know, in the Greek. Uh, I, 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 I question myself as to whether just to kind of gloss over all of this. But we do need to at least touch on it. Sexual immorality. Now... Figuratively, folks, that's idolatry, spiritual adultery. Impurity, well, that's unclean. That's, that, that relates to the flesh. All of this stuff, I want you to, to note that it all has to do with the flesh, the flesh which profits nothing. Passion, that's, that's emotion, lust, the Greek word, 
desire, lust, evil. Evil, that's the word depraved, worthless. The old man is depraved, worthless. Are you getting this? Covetousness, which is idolatry. Anger, well, that's violent passion. Rage, that's outburst of emotion, passion. Malice, that's wicked disposition. And slander, blasphemy, which is, you know, <sighs> blasphemy. That is, the word literally, folks, means you switch right for wrong or wrong for right. You call what God disapproves right, which exchanges the truth of God for a lie. Foul language, that's filthy communication. Anytime someone comes up to me and tries to put me under law, I look at that as filthy communication. Anytime someone gets angry at me, I, I, I go back to the, to the rage, outburst of emotion, the anger, violent passion. The, are you getting this? You know, look, folks, you can look at all this as purely physical or, you know, ver horizontal, okay? I believe the context bears out, I think what the Holy Spirit, the thought that He's trying to convey here is, is that these things, we're looking at, at, a, at a, a spiritual context, a Christian context, a fellowship context. We're looking at a, a context that involves itself around ministry. Lying. To deceive by falsehood. And folks, every bit of this occurs every day in the context of Christian conversation and ministry. And keep in mind what God says about the law. What does He say about the law? He says that the law, the strength of sin, is the law. Is what He says. Uh, it's that verse. I'll have to look that up. 1 Corinthians 15, the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my brethren, be ye steadfast, unmov unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I pointed out that, it, that an, an idiom is, is a phrase or an expression that has, it has a figurative or sometimes literal meaning. And there, there's thousands. There's thousands. Well, I don't know. It could be, maybe there's millions. I don't know. That occur frequently in all languages, every nation, every kindred, tribe, tongue. Okay. We're looking at putting off the old man and putting on the new man, a figurative idiom which illustrates a literal fact. The concept is seen, folks, in both Old and New Testament verses. I want to bring to your mind uh, here a few verses. Uh, I want to read a, read a few here. I've got quite a few. It's amazing how many there are. I want to read, I've got to read a few. The, the following verses, they bring clarity to this putting off and, and putting on. Romans 13, 12. Let us put on the armor of light, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. And of course, right here in Colossians 3, 8, the putting off and putting on the new man. In Romans 13, 14. Instead, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, and make no provision for the desires of the flesh. 2 Corinthians 4.15 or 4.16 Therefore we don't lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, yet our inner self is being renewed day by day. Ephesians 2.10 For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. It's not our own works. That's not the old man. That's the new. Ephesians 2.15 By abolishing in his flesh the law of commandments and decrees, he did this to create in himself one new man 
out of the two, thus making peace. Ephesians 4.22 To put off your former way of life, your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. Ephesians 4.24 And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Romans 6.4 Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Romans 7, 6, But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, and not in oldness of the letter, that is, law. 2 Peter 1, 4, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be, become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Ephesians 4.13 Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So the concept, folks, is intertwined throughout the entire Word of God. In Psalms 132 verse 9 May your priests be clothed with righteousness and your saints shout for joy. Job chapter 29, I put on righteousness and it clothed me. Job 27, 6, I will hold fast my righteousness and never let go as long as I live. My conscience will not accuse me. What about Isaiah chapter 59? He put on righteousness like a breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in a cloak of zeal. I love Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10. I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exult in my God, for He has clothed me with garments of salvation and wrapped me in a robe of righteousness as a groom wears a priestly headdress and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. This is a mind renewal, folks. Ephesians 4.23, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. And folks, that mind renewal, that change of mind, is the word repentance. I don't know how well a job I've done in, in, in opening up the, what I believe is the mind or putting forth what I believe is the mind of the Holy Spirit here in these passages here, folks, uh, that we're looking at in the third chapter. I can't emphasize, I can't stress enough that we're not all of a sudden back in, in law here, under the law. Well, we, we were never under the law to even begin with. But we're not to approach this as those who are under law. We are to build upon, you know, precept upon precept. We, we should have, before we even come to this point, understood that we're not under law, but we're under grace. And so when we look at, at all of this stuff, all that we're to put off and all that we're to, to put on, we need to come to, to realize, folks, and I hope that you have. I hope it's be begun to dawn in your thinking that this is a, a putting off and putting on in its entirety. That is, it's basically a move away from self and law to Christ and grace. It's, it's our living as who we are, sinless, righteous, new creations in Christ Jesus. Because it's only there that we, that, we, that we have any possible way of discovering the peace and the joy and the rest and the, the contentment that God would have for, for us. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.